Excellent. So in today's lecture, I want to pick up where we last left off. So effectively, we had a great presentation uh, last lecture uh, before we moved into uh, standard time. So we're going to have much darker days ahead of us, very literally. Um, yeah, this is now going to be a night class. Um, but we also kind of reiterated uh, the very first phase of our shell lab, which those instructions should be posted on the playlist uh, from, from, the, uh, from the October 31st uh, lecture that we had. I'll post the one that had the demo uh, soon, but we should be at a stage at least in shell lab, which is what we're currently working on, where we can start on task two. Because if I'm not mistaken, the lecture that was uh, that, that's currently available is a complete and full breakdown of what the motivations of Shell Lab are. And it even goes through and shows you how to complete the very first trace, trace one, and how to test it. So I wanna pick up from there and look at how to accomplish a couple of traces. Oh, my. let me get my um, display inside here working. So I want to spend today's class to go ahead and uh, cover traces two, and it, if we have enough time, maybe all the way up to trace five. So we'll try to go ahead and work through. My, my goal is to try to go through and explain the motivation behind each of the traces to see what's happening with the reference shell versus our shell, and then introduce the new concepts that we're supposed to be learning for that implementation. And so... Ideally, we can do this within maybe the next two weeks is, uh, is what my goal is. So we'll see how that, that works out. And that'll give me a little bit of lanyard time to see if we can't cover at least rudimentary the concepts for uh, any the, the last remaining lab that we have. Okay. Where is, okay, so we left off on trace two. So next time we're going to continue on this. So our goal in trace two is, again, we're going to want to execute our trace2.txt file that's going to be fed into our test harness using our shell driver, Perl script. And so we can always do a cat on this, and I'm going to do that as well, to be able to view the contents of these, of these uh, trace files because they're designed to be human readable. So we, we can, and, and in fact, each of them have a header comment that tries to convey to you, the developer of this tiny shell, what functionality your shell is going to have to have in order to pass this particular test. So in this new trace, we're going to have to run a foreground job several times. So, okay, after we have our hashtags, we can see that we have a call to the shell application to ls, which prints to our uh, standard out the contents of the directory that we invoke this application from. So now we don't use relative paths, we're using full paths because setting up relative paths is something that your shell would have to accommodate and we haven't implemented that. So we would make a call from our root directory to our bin directory to ls, which is the application name. Then we're going to go ahead and call sleep, which is going to instruct our shell driver, Perl script, to pause for a second before executing the next command. So after we sleep for a second, we'll call ls again. Then we'll sleep for another second, and then we're going to call ls again. Now, again, at any time, I can go ahead and run this trace on the reference shell to see what the expected output. And then we should run that trace on our own tiny shell before we start implementing to see what our current implementation is, what our current uh, output's gonna be. And then we can compare those and see what do we have to do to try to improve our tiny shell so it's in line with our reference shell. Because again, the point of each of these traces is to ensure that your output from your shell is gonna be the same as the reference shell. Now, one thing to be aware of is sometimes you might change or implement your code and it forces prior traces to start to, uh, to, start to error out, right? And that's one of the advantages of running the, um, the, uh, the, uh, 
the check, the cumulative check to see that all your prior traces still work the way you expect them to. And we're, we're going to step through that uh, in today's uh, in today's lecture. Okay, and so let me set up here so that I'm where everyone else is. I'm just going to open up a terminal really quick. I'm going to do my LS here. So I'm inside of my handout folder. And let me just make sure that we are actually picking up exactly where I expect us to. And I don't have any extra lingering implementation uh, uh, inside my system. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, let's do this. Let's uh, Let's check our tiny shell. So we have trace one complete. And yeah, okay, perfect. That's exactly what I want to happen. And then as soon as it tries to evaluate trace two, we're seeing a big diff occur and I don't get points. And so that lets me know, okay, trace one and it works, but trace two doesn't. Another way I could evaluate that, and this is what we're gonna be seeing on the next slide, is that I could do a diff between, um, let's, send to standard uh, out my, the results of a call to make on test one and send to on test. Okay, but I need our test because that's my reference test and just test. Let me see if I can't stretch this out so we can see it all over more. Okay, let's hit in. Okay, so this, is perfect. That's that illustrates that my first test is working. And so just to evaluate my second test, and we can see, ah, we have lots of differences. Okay, so now let's see here. Let's actually make those in isolation. So this is the actual output. So if I wanted to take a look at it, well, what we see is we have the echo of the comment from our test harness. Then it looks like we have the printout of our job. So this is probably our job ID. This is our process ID. This looks like the instruction. Oh, this is on, did I do test three? Not what I want. Test two. Okay, let's see here. We have, yeah, this is this more in line with what uh, that uh, trace was, the text of the trace. So we can see I have my echo of my uh, my comments, and then all the contents of this directory, and then we have all the contents of the directory again. And then all the contents of the directory again. So it prints out the contents of the directory three times. Okay, so that's what we want. Let's see what we currently have. No, two. Okay, so we're getting we're getting the echo, but we're not handling we're not handling any uh, any actual external application calls. Because if you remember, the last thing that we implemented inside of the evaluation method is to only check to see, we can open this up and see. Let's see what our current basis is. So if I go to my C code, no. I hate this idea of when you drag a window too close to the corner, it decides just to maximize. Okay. So we can see, let's see where we last left off. Let's see what our eval is. So we remember inside of our main loop, we have our rebel. So this is our rebel code here. And so one of the big things happening in Rebel is this eval function that's evaluating our command lines. And so right now, our eval function is very simple, right? We had created this uh, argv array that can hold the max amount of arguments. And then we created a uh, integer. And in fact, let's do this. I'm, I'm going to compress this logic. So I'm going to initialize 
instead of declare and assign. But here, what I'm going to do is then I'm going to parse line and I'm going to send it the command line that's sent to us. And it's going to tokenize it and fill our argv array. And then we're going to send now that parsed argv array that's been populated by this parse line, which was a helper function. We're going to send that to built in command. And right now, the only implementation we have in built in command is to check to see if it's quit. And if it does, we exit our system application. So now we're going to have to actually identify that we want to run a application that is not a built-in command. That's going to be one of the tasks for uh, trace two. And then we're going to have to go ahead and set it up so we can execute it. So let's see how we can do that. Okay, so again, to get to the stage we have, we've already seen this, we're going to make our reference test two, we're going to make a reference test, uh, and then we're going to make our version, and then we do our assessment. We've done that. We've witnessed in real time what the difference is. So now the next thing we're going to do is step through how are we going to improve what we have. So we're going to have to refactor our eval process. We just looked at our eval process, and pretty much this the first three lines, the ones that are not highlighted are the ones that we've already implemented. The ones that are highlighted are what we're gonna to have to add. So we see that the shell reads a uh, command from the user or a script, right? So we've gone through this process. It parses the command into constituent parts, including the command name and argument. Uh, the shell checks if the command is a built-in command, that's what we implemented in trace one. But if it's not a built-in command, the shell is gonna use a fork exec me mechanism to run the command as a separate process. And then the shell will wait for the process to finish if it's a foreground job. Okay, so some key system functions that we're gonna have to know about in order to do this is this concept of fork, which is gonna create a new process by duplicating the calling process. Then we're gonna have a executable uh, execution vector, which is gonna replace the uh, current process image with a new one based off a given command and arguments vector. And for sure, that's called uh, execv. And then we have the wait PID, which is going to wait for a child process to complete. So these are all things that are provided to us by the system. You can go ahead and look at the documentation. We'll kind of just briefly describe how we need them. Now, in order to resolve our issue that we're having, we're going to implement our fork exec mechanism properly to go ahead and execute our external commands. Okay, so fork is a system call that's going to be used to create our new process known as a child process, which is the duplicate of the current process, which we will now call the parent. The parent process receives the PID, the uh, process ID of the child, whereas the child receives a zero. If the fork fails, then it returns a minus one, indicating that some error had occurred. Typically, we want to handle errors. Right now, we're going to ignore error handling with the hope that some future trace is going to try to generate an error. And if it doesn't, then, well, we still match the reference trace. We just have very uh, non-robust code. Okay, in terms of uh, uh, the executable function that we have, the uh, exec v system call replaces the child's process memory space with a new program. So again, we kind of duplicate when we create a fork, but then we're going to override or uh, overwrite the contents with the application we actually want to execute. It takes the command name and an array of string arguments it does not return if successful. If it returns, that means an error had occurred. And of course, our parents role, the core process, the main process that's uh, gonna be doing the forking. After forking, the parents should wait for the child's termination using something like wait PID to handle uh, foreground tasks. For background tasks, the parent continues execution and monitors the child uh, asynchronously. All right, so here. So again, our step-by-step -step on what we want to do in our eval is, and this effectively our pseudocode, is we're going to convert the command line string into an array of arguments. Then we're going to determine, uh, we're going to check if the command is a built-in and executed if it is. So we have invoked this function, but we're not yet capturing the return value from it. 
So we're going to just update our, our uh, code there. Then we're going to handle the external command. So if it's not a built-in uh, command, then what we want to do is we want to fork a new process. And then in that child process, we want to attempt to execute the command with the execv system call. And if, ex ex uh, if execv fails, then we can print an error message and exit, which we might I might not do this in my implementation, right? I'm going to wait for that trace. So let's... Let's do this. I think I might ignore this and see what happens. Let's do this. We'll strike through this one. And then in terms of managing our forecast, if the command is a forecast process, then the, uh, then the parent waits for the child's completion, where there's a, uh, a function, another function that we can see, wait FG short for wave foreground that we'll have to implement. In fact, if we look in our code originally, let's go back up to our code here. Inside of the functions that we have to implement, we see these are all the functions we have to implement. And we see we not only have to implement eval, which we've already touched, we not only have to implement the built-in command function, which we've already touched just with trace one, but we're also gonna have to implement this wait foreground, which we'll touch a little bit for um, for trace two, although I don't think it really evaluates whether uh, it, it's not going to be deep evaluation of this. So we'll have to go back and add more logic to this one in a future trace. And that's going to be true with a lot of these functions, but we'll iteratively make them more and more complex. And as we get deeper into our traces, we'll have to go back and refactor them so that they're more and more robust or handle more and more var a variety of tasks and, uh, and uh, handle more responsibilities. Okay. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so this is going to be my implementation uh, based off of my, oh, and it looks like I do. Mm -hmm. Do I want, okay. We'll stick with what I have on the slide just to make sure I don't mess things up too much. We'll, we'll, we'll check with testing on what we do and don't need. That's one thing I do like to do. Okay, so let's go. So uh, so based off of this pseudocode, we can actually read line, line by line what's happening here. But instead of reading this entire block, let me uh, jump over so that I can go ahead and uh, just walk through this implementation. So let's jump over here. Now let's go to my eval. So get that down past the main, the first function after our main function is our eval function. Right now it is very, um, it's very lean. So the first thing we're gonna do is recall that the built-in command function actually returns back a value whether the command was built in or not. So if it was a one that returned, then we attempted to uh, execute, but it was a built-in command and it was executed. And if it wasn't a one, if it's a zero, then it's gonna be some external command that uh, for an application that we need to run from our shell. So let's grab that. Let's grab, and let's give this a good readable name. Like say, for instance, it's gonna be uh, effectively, we're treating, it's an integer, but we're treating as if it's Boolean uh, value. So I'm gonna use a Boolean type variable name. So is built in command, Okay, so based off of that, now I have a readable field that I can use to go ahead and track what I should do. Okay, so now I'm going to check if it uh, is not a built-in command, then I'm going to want to do this code. In this instance, if we go and we pass in our argument array and it determines, oh, that's not something that's been built in. So it's going to return control back to our eval function. We'll get back the value zero or one, whether it's built in. So if it's not built in, then we want to do something in response to that. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to want to do is let's, uh, oh, let's indent. 
So let's manage the child process because in order for us to go ahead and execute, we're gonna have to go ahead and fork a child process. So I'm get, remember the fork function is gonna return back to me a uh, PID to the parent process. And so this would now be the parent process when we invoke for a fork to occur. Okay, so now that we've forked it, let's go ahead and check. If our PID is equal to zero, I hear it. Okay, so if we're in the child process, then I'm going to grab, I'm going to invoke that execution vector function, another system call function that's going to return back a integer value to me. The integer value is, recall, if it doesn't give back anything, it's going to be a zero, which means everything is operational. If it returns a non-zero value, then an error occurred. So we'll just handle the error occurring for this. We'll try commenting it out to see if it has any implications, but we'll, we'll go through a robust route for now. Okay, so I'm gonna grab this value and then I'm gonna call on this system function. And so the system function is going to require two parameters. The first is going to be There we go. The first is going to be the actual uh, call, the uh, the application name, which is going to be the first element. And then the other is going to be our argument array that could potentially have all the flags or other um, the other uh, things that we need to send to our application. So effectively, our arguments for that application from the command line. So like, for instance, if it's ls, that would be like our dash l, that would be like our dash a, right? All these are important um, pieces of data that's going to affect the execution of our application. Okay. Okay, so after I do that, I'm going to get back a... Um, a result. So let's check to see this status. And let's see if our status is less than zero. And if it is, then I'm going to do a print. To the, and I'm going to print just some message that says something along the lines of whatever the argument that you tried to pass in, which is presumably the application name, command not found, and then new line character. And then let's also pass in here the very first element inside of our argument vector that represents the application name that we're trying to invoke. Also, let me do this. I don't know why this is defaulted to four. Oh, that's awful. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, let's change this. Okay. Okay, let's save this at the moment. Now we're not quite done yet, but let's see what happens if we just run the code as it were. So based off of this implementation, let's just see where we're at. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure we save. I'm gonna jump into here and then I'm gonna do GCC dash G because that allows me to go ahead and have all the great compiler augmentations that we saw last time we, we were doing this. And then uh, I'm going to give it my source code file. And then we make sure that our output is called tiny shell, T shell. Oh, this has to be a S and not a C. Oops. 
Oh, see this? This is a, uh, a strongly typed language. I have to declare the data type. I remember saying it was an int, but I guess I, I forgot to actually put my uh, the data type. So let's save that. Perfect. Okay, so now what I'm just gonna do is I'm just gonna launch into my tiny shell and see how it's running and just see how this implementation is working based off of kind of how we were playing around with it. Um, okay, so we launch into our tiny shell. And so we know that if we type in quit, this is what we did last time, it quits us out. That's good, that's the only built-in command we have. So now the other thing we need to do is if we do bin slash ls, Oh yeah, so that's that's working, right? Like we can execute ls, but does anyone see something that's kind of funky? And in fact, let me see. I want to I want to check something here. Oh, we have a couple of funky things, right? Okay, so let's see this again. So we're getting there. We're a little close. Um Oh my. Okay, so if I if I run we are getting our directory to print out, but notice my prompt reprints before I get my result from the ls application but it's not just that i'm not terminating either right like i'm not i haven't returned control in fact if i try to do anything it's going to cause a segmentation fault to go ahead and occur and that's because we need to go ahead and wait our our uh our uh our parent process has to wait for the child process to complete and so if we don't implement that wait fg we're not going to be able to obviously get past this this trace. So this is an example of like a partial implementation, but then we have this small little part that is going to uh, prevent us from moving along. Okay, so let's go back here and then check. So what we want to do then is inside of here. So after we do something with the child process, then the next thing I'm going to want to do is I want to do something with the parent process. So I'm going to just make a comment here to let me know, okay, this is going to be part of the parent process. And then what I want to do here is I want to check if If it's not a background application, and recall, I'm giving this information. So what is BG? Let's take and just re-examine the code we already have. So recall, parse line is a helper function that's fully implemented for us already. So when it parses the line, the distinction between when a user supplies us a command is if that command ends with an ampersand, that's going to determine whether it's a foreground or background process. So we already have the implementation to determine if it's a background or foreground process. Now, if it's a background process, we don't want to wait for the application to finish, right? We just want to keep moving along from our shell. So we only on the instance that it's not a background process, hence a foreground process, if it's one or the other, it's a binary state, then we want to wait for the foreground, we want we one way for the child to finish processing before the parent continues on. That's the motivation. Okay, so if it's not a background process, then we're going to call on this other function that we have to implement. We haven't implemented it yet, but we're just going to call on it. And in fact, it's going to take in the argument of a PID, right? Based off of the PID, it's going to wait for that PID to finish processing it. And once it does, then we can resume with our shell. Okay, so let us save this. And so now we, now 
Our eval looks pretty good at this point. Let's let's just look at it based off of our pseudocode. We've created this argument array. We've called this helper function to go ahead and parse our command line and populate our argument vector. And then it returns to us whether we're gonna have a background or foreground job. Then we're gonna go ahead and call uh, and send that argument array to built-in command and determine if it's a background command or not, I mean, a built-in command or not. And if it's not, then we're gonna start executing this code where I'm gonna separate it into forking into a child process and doing what I need to execute the child. And then also uh, handle the logic for the parent process. If it's a foreground, then I'm gonna wait. And if it's not a foreground, then I'm not gonna wait. So now let's wait, let's jump to the wait uh, FG function and see what its current implementation looks like. Okay, so let's jump here. We can see right now it's doing nothing. So what I can do here, just to get this to do something, just to get it to uh, potentially uh, work, and let's see here, let's jump here, is when I execute my foreground jobs, such as those in trace two, it should keep the shell interactive while they execute. The shell waits for each foreground job to finish before prompting the user for new input. So in order to prevent our uh, resource wastage, which we see here with the segmentation fault, right? That's what we're getting. The shell must wait for foreground process to complete, preventing them from becoming orphaned or zombie processes. We can use the wait PID without uh, the um, with without the hang uh, the w n o the w no hang option ensures the shell waits for the specific child process to terminate. And so here we need to synchronize between our shell and our foreground process in order for us to go ahead and complete this. So we're gonna now jump into the wait FG, which is a very simple set of code. I'm gonna implement it, but I'll just read it through really quick. I'm gonna create just a, um, a uh, variable, an undeclared variable, which then I'm gonna give the address to as a parameter, as one of the arguments into uh, my wait PID function here. So for, we're gonna wait for the process with the specified PID to finish. We're gonna use untraced option, which can be used also to return if a child has stopped. And uh, so here we're gonna give it the PID. We're gonna give it a reference to this status, which we can use in the future. And then we're also gonna use this, uh, this option here. So let's jump into here and to do just that. So we're gonna create a variable to maintain our status. And right now we will then go ahead and invoke wait PID. And here we'll pass it, the PID that's passed to us, right? We're passed a PID inside as a argument. Then we will go ahead and provide the address to our status. And then we will use W untraced. And we should not, not ungraced, untraced. Excellent. So let's save that and see what the result is on our tiny shell. So here, let's launch into our tiny shell. Uh, I'm gonna quit out. Yeah, that still works. Okay, let me try bin ls and now we can see, uh, oh, you know what? We need to recompile. Always remember, recompile. So let's recompile and now let's run again. And now when I do this, you can see this works as per expected. Now we're waiting for that child process to complete before the foreground picks back up. We can see immediately I get all of my directory contents, uh, contents to print out immediately after issuing this command. And now the prompt is now waiting for me to enter a new prompt in which I should be able to go ahead and hit quit, which it successfully does. 
So here, let me try this again. Let's launch it to Tiny Shell. Let's see if I can launch this and this and this. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with how that looks. So the next thing I'm gonna do is let's compare the difference between our reference shell and our current implementation. So again, let me go ahead and redirect to uh, standard in the results from make our test and then redirect from standard in as the second argument, the output from my test on my own shell. And we will check those differences. And ideally there, that's perfect. We see the only differences we have are it's testing against the reference shell versus the tiny shell. So now if I, again, if I go ahead and then go to my check tiny shell cumulative scoring script, let's see if I get my two points for trace one, and then I am gonna get my two points for trace two, and then up, oh, I fail at trace three. So we are now done with trace two, we can move on. Does anyone have any questions? Or does up to this point make sense so far? Uh, let me just double check inside of the chat. Okay, I think we're pretty good. And of course, the last slide I have here is just an illustration of recompile your code, something I forgot to do, and then we can test in two different ways. We can either do the, the diff between the two, or we can check with the cumulative score. Now, one thing I advocate you doing is try to experiment with your eval function and remove things if it doesn't make sense and try to understand why all the code that's there should be there, right? So I, I, interactive testing is a good way to ensure, we were talking about this earlier in class, interactive testing is a good way to firm up what your expectations are on why you have to have code based off of what the, uh, the environment with the system expects. Right. And I think like one of the things I said I was gonna do is was removing that error message. Let's actually do that. I'll keep it in there, but I'm pretty sure nothing's gonna happen if I remove this error message because we're not testing uh, against this error at all. I don't think that's part of our trace. Uh, what was that in? Was that in our eval? I believe that was in our eval. Let's see, so just let's jump to our eval here and we could see if I were to comment out this, um do, do, do. okay so here suppose i comment out this if check entirely and now if i go back and i recompile and i check the difference between the two we can see yeah even without handling our error that's not going to affect us in trace two Error handling isn't something that we're evaluating here. Hopefully it's something we do in a future trace. We'll find out because I'll leave it just commented out of my own code right now. But I didn't want to deviate too much from the slide. So if I have code in the slides, I'm just going to stick with that. But I want, you know, be it behooves you to try and play around with this in other ways too. So if you get lines of code and we talked about it a little bit in class and you're like, well, what if I don't do this thing? Try it. Try removing it, you could either put in the debugger or you try execute and see what behavior you get as a result from that. And always compare to your uh, your reference shell because the under the idea here is it's we're trying to motivate a strong understanding of how we're building this shell giving the boilerplate code that we have and why every line of code we're going to add is going to make a meaningful difference. Okay, so now let's jump back over here. Um, I feel like there we go. Okay, now let's move on to trace three. So for trace three, we're going to execute with our shell driver like we have been doing. And of course, we just use the, uh, the the makes to be able to easily do that for us. But here we're going to have we're going to test our background job execution. So in trace two, 
we were challenged with being able to do foreground executions. But again, if I just do a cat on trace three TXT, I can clearly see the header comment says run a background job. And it's very simple. There's only two instructions here. It's going to run the application, my spin with one second. And it's going to do that as a background. Let's just see. Let's, let's remind ourselves what happens when we run that. I'm just going to run it from here. My spin one. Okay, so I didn't run it as a background and I'm not in tiny shell, I'm just illustrating right now. I'm not even in the reference shell. Guess I can jump into the reference shell. Um, so let me do that. Oops. Okay, so I should be able to, I'm gonna do it as a foreground where it's gonna wait until it's done. But in my reference shell, oops, we don't have a history. If I add an ampersand to the tail, now this is going to make this a background job. So which means it's going to report to the terminal that a background job is being executed and then or and then immediately give me my prompt again. And so I think the idea here, and I don't know how I don't think I'm fast enough for this. So let's do this. I'll, I'll just do my spin a little bit longer. Let's do four seconds. And then I'll do, um, oh, I don't have that. I think uh, it was LS, was it? Yeah, so it'll probably be something like this, where it wants you to have one thing print out. And then we can actually stay. Actually, let's quit. Let's, we'll wait. We'll wait until I get to the next slide to see where we make the, the makes. But it's, okay, so that gives us an idea of the instructions we want to do. So we're going to execute the MySpin program for a second in the background. And then we're going to execute the ls command to list the contents of our current directory, which is going to be obviously a foreground, right? We're running as a foreground operation. Okay, so let us. So now the first thing we do whenever we're assigned a new trace is we want to see what the default behavior is from our reference shell immediately through our tester, and then we're going to compare that to our current implementation. So let's do that. So. I'm going to make our reference test on three. And so we can see, oh yeah, look at this. I'm, I'm going to scroll up. Let's take a look in particular. So we can see the expected output is going to be the echo of our comments. Then it's going to be the uh, printout of the background job. And then we're going to have a printout of all of the contents in our directory. And let's compare that to what we currently have. So let's make test three. And oh, well, let's see. So let's see here. I'm getting part of that, right? So I'm getting the echo and I'm getting the printout of the LS, but I'm not getting, I'm not getting the, a, uh, I'm not getting the, a, um, the background process. In fact, if I do a difference, it's easier if I do the difference. Let's do clear here and let's do the def. Okay. Yeah, we can see. Yep, we have one thing that's different. It's the fact that we display something when we assign that background, uh, when that, that background process, the background job. Okay, so that's what we have to resolve. Should be easy enough, right? So it means, well, thinking about how we're going to accomplish this, we're going to go into our eval process. This is what we're already doing in the eval process. So the only thing we have to add into what we're already doing, so where, again, the shell reads and parses the user commands into components, it executes the built-in commands immediately. For external commands, it employs that fork exec uh, mechanism we talked about in the last uh, trace. If it's a foreground job, we wait upon it's being finished. But if it's a background job, we'll allow it to proceed concurrently, and we'll track with an add job call. So key helper functions we should know about. So there's some helper functions that are fully implemented for us. There's the add job function, which adds a new background job to the job list. It stores the PID 
the job state and command line, ensuring the shell can manage and track the job. And there's a PID to JID function call that maps a process ID to its corresponding job ID in the job list, allowing the shell to refer to jobs in a user-friendly manner. So again, if there's no matching job is found, it just returns a zero. So in order to resolve our trace three issue, what we wanna do is we need to integrate the add job into our command execution workflow to handle background processes. We have to ensure our add job successfully logs each background job and prints in details for user visibility. And then we got to uh, modify our eval to use our add job when starting background jobs. Okay, so in order to actually implement this, let's take a look at some of the code that we're interested in. So background jobs, we have to track background jobs in order to determine what is currently running and be able to check back their state and whatnot. Well, so if we go into our global variables, there are some global variables that are declared at the very top of our application. The ones that are pertinent right now are gonna be uh, this one. This is next JID. That's gonna be our next job ID to allocate. And it defaults at one. And then here you can see we have a structure for our jobs. And inside of our structure, we have our PID, we have a job ID, we have the state, whether it's a background job, a foreground job, whether it's an undefined job or a stopped job. And then we have right here, our command line, the instructions that were actually assigned to this job. And then right under that, you can see, we then have a jobs array that had that's uh, initialized to the size of max jobs, which is again defined at the very top level of our uh, of our uh, source code, and that's going to hold effectively our job underscore t uh, structs here. So this is what we're going to utilize in order to add jobs. Let me see. Do it. I. Yep. We talked about this. And so um, let's see here, let's just make sure. So central to the shell's ability to manage our background processes is the jobs array we just looked at. We already looked at each of these attributes. So uh, when a background job is initiated, it should be recorded into that jobs array with a new job ID and marked with the state BG. The shell can reference this list to provide status updates and allow job control and ensure proper termination of background processes. Okay, so let's see how we can go ahead and implement this. So inside of our eval, we can see we're just going to add a couple lines of uh, code. We're going to add a uh, else clause on the instance that it is a background job. So if it's not a background job, we're like, okay, let's wait for the foreground for the uh, foreground uh, process to operate. But if it is, now we're going to have to do something. We're going to have to add the background job to our job list, and then we're going to have to print the jobs PID to and the command because that's actually what we're being tested against. So we have to make sure our system out message is the same as our reference shell. Okay, let me jump in here and actually implement this so we can test this ourselves. So here, right inside my eval function, I'm gonna put this else clause. And inside of our else clause, we're going to, I didn't show this, we talked about it. We'll look at it in just a moment. We're gonna call this add job helper function, which is gonna take, in jobs, which is a um, global variable, it takes it in as a parameter. Um, it's going to take our PID that we get right here. Okay. 
we're going to go ahead and get, and then here we're going to set. So whether it's a background or foreground, I'm going to use a ternary operator with VG or FG. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pass it my command line. And we'll actually look at this parameter. We'll actually look at the function to make sure we understand what's happening with each of those. And the next thing I, I want to do is I just want to go ahead and call my uh, print statement that's going to have a, pr a formatted print statement that's going to have the exact same structure as what our, our uh, reference shell has. So inside of the box is going to be our um, job ID. And then inside of the parentheses is going to be our uh, process ID. And then we're going to have the string, which is the command line for this process associated with this process. And so here I have another helper function. If you recall, it was PID to JID. And so I can just pass it my PID and it's going to provide to me, it's going to give me back a job ID. I'm also going to give it my process ID and then I'm going to give it my command line. All are local variables inside of my eval function. Let me save that. And again, let me do this just to make sure we're all on the same page. I'm going to go to add job and we can see that add job is a fully defined function right here. It adds a job to the job list where it takes in a, our, uh, our jobs array. It takes in a PID. It takes in a state, which is defined. We have aliases for a state, BG and FG defined at the top of our source code. And then it's going to take in our uh, a pointer for our, our command line arguments. And then it's just going to go through and add that job for us. Perfect. And then if I also check my, um, what was it? It was my PID to, we can see this is also one of the other helper functions that are defined for me where I pass it a PID and it's going to return back to me with a job ID. And in fact, if you ever forget what is available to you, recall inside of the, the header section of our code base, these are going to be the header routine, the helper routines that are provided for us that are fully implemented. So get acquainted with these. You can see how it'll make our job very useful where we don't reinvent the wheel having to manage this. Okay. So now let's see what happens. Um, so let's, uh, let's recompile our code. Okay, no issues. Always good whenever you change uh, any of your source code to recompile. The next thing we want to do is let's let's just launch into it. Let's see what happens. Okay, so we've launched into this. So we know that we're going to have to do this. Um, what was it? Was it my spin with one? And so let's do this initially. It's going to wait a second. Okay, so the foreground process works in our shell. So now let's try my spin one and then ampersand. And it goes, ah, that's exactly the output I want. Okay, so let me quit out of this. So now we'll start to check. But before we do that, let me catch up with my slides with my presentation. Yep, and that's the next thing is to make sure you do a verification that after we've tested it out, we've run our shell, we kind of toyed around and explored and like, yeah, this looks like kind of what the display look like if I uh, issue those commands, let's actually do the diff. So let's do a diff between make on test three and uh, nope, our test three. 
it doesn't really matter, but I do like to put my reference test in the uh, beginning and then test three here. Then I can say, yeah, the only thing that's different are gonna be my process IDs and that's okay. My process IDs are unique. So there's, there's no guarantee that I'm going to replicate process IDs between running my applications. So I can test to make sure I get points for this by running my check script, my check tiny shell script. And so at this point, I get two points for trace one and I will get two points for trace two and I will get two points for trace three. And now here I should kind of crash out of my system because we have not implemented trace four. And there we go. We see that, yeah, we did not get those points and we won't get any points moving forward. So we only handled the first three traces. So let's go ahead and clear that and take a look. We have 15 minutes left. Let's see if we can't get past trace four at least by the time we end today. Which, let's see, if we get through trace four, that represents what, 20% of this lab, right? Okay, so for trace four, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna examine the trace file and figure out what is the objective? What is the motivation that our shell is now gonna have to be upgraded with in terms of its functionality? So um, again, the goal for our trace is to ultimately execute and be successful. This particular goal is gonna be the ability to test the, another built-in function. This built-in function will be called the jobs uh, command. So now we know right off the bat, that means we're gonna have to go into built-in command and add another evaluation. Okay, so here, what we can see is after our uh, header comment, there's three instructions that's gonna be fed to the test harness. A call to my spin two as a background process, a call to my spin three, that will also be a background process, and then a call to jobs. So we already know that my spin two and three is gonna execute that program for two seconds in the background, allowing the shell to proceed with other commands. And similar with three, it's gonna execute that in the background, allowing our shell to proceed with commands. But what's jobs? It's a built-in command that lists all the background and stop jobs showing their job ID, their current state, and the command line that started each job. So the first thing we should do is we should see what does our reference shell do when we do this trace, and then what does our current uh, shell do? So let's, let's evaluate that. So let's make our test four, and we can see, yep. So we have echoed the header comment, and then we have the two jobs that are printed out because they're background jobs. Remember, each time we make a background job, it sends the standard out a print that that is a background job. But notice this line here is an invocation of the jobs command displaying all the jobs inside of the jobs list. So how are we gonna implement this? Well, we know we'll have to go into built-in command what we're already doing inside of built-in command is we're getting the command name, right? That's the first element from our argument vector. Then we're checking if it's a quick command, we exit the program. So obviously the next thing we should do is if the job, if it's a jobs command, then we should print the list of jobs and return one to indicate that we just executed a built-in command. And if we don't do any of that, we've already done this last part. Otherwise, if we didn't do any of the, the uh, the uh, prior statements, those if checks, then we'll return zero to indicate that it was not a built-in command. So a key helper function that we're gonna take advantage of is list jobs, which prints the job list. Um, so what are the new actions we need to do inside of our built-in command check? We're gonna check for jobs. We're gonna invoke the list jobs function, providing the jobs array, and we're gonna return the value of one. So let's take a quick look. This isn't code we have to write, right? I usually put code we have to write highlighted in yellow. What I've started to do in this slide is start printing out 
the code so we can examine what helper functions we're going to call on. So in this instance, this is our list jobs function that iterates through the jobs list and prints out the job ID, the process ID, the state, the state could either be running, foreground, or stopped, and the command line for each active job. So this is provided for us. I'm just showing you so that you can see what the parameters are, you can see what the line-by-line -line implementation is for the helper function we're going to rely on that's already given to us in our source code. And I want to highlight, we saw this in the last trace, but I'm keeping all of the trace segments of my slide deck autonomous and isolated. So we're just going to re-highlight that in our global variables, there's a jobs array that's being used by the list jobs to be able to iterate through. Okay, so now let's actually try to implement this. Well, given the fact that we have these helper functions, it should be relatively painless and simple. We use string compare to compare the command that we parse, that we grab in the very first line of our uh, built-in command function to that of jobs. And if there's no difference between them, if they're the same, right, if, if the result is zero, then we want to invoke that helper function list jobs and provide it our global variable jobs where we've been adding jobs to, and then we just want to return with one. Okay, I'm gonna jump through. So let me also go ahead and do this along with you. So let me go here to jump to my built in command function. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, so here I need to add after I check to see if it's a quit. Let's see, let's add this new command. So let me make, I'm gonna scaffold out an if. Okay, now I'm going to do the evaluation in the if. We'll do a string compare. And we're going to commit, uh, compare that command to jobs, the new built-in command that we want our shell to support. And so if it is equal, then we will call this helper function this jobs, oops, where we pass it in the jobs. And then we will also return the value of one. Let's save that. Now let's see what happens. Um, okay, so fortunately I have my trace there. I'm going to recompile. I'm going to uh, launch my shell, my tiny shell. I'm going to try my spin. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do four. Perfect. I can say I was successfully able to launch one background process. I was able to successfully launch another background process, I was successfully able to then display the contents of my job. And I think the only thing I have to do here then is to evaluate if this trace is done. So let's go ahead and do what we have been doing. Let's go ahead and uh, do a diff for a send standard in the result of the make on my reference test on three, three or four, four, we're on four now, right? And on my test four. Okay, and if we're lucky, we see, yeah, we get the same output. The only difference is the process ID and that doesn't count against us, right? We're not supposed to be able to 
produce an equality on that. Okay. So let's go here to check and see if we don't get two points for trace one, two points for trace two, two points for trace three, and finally, two points for trace four. But... And then we fail on trace five, zero points, but that's perfect because that is the trace that we last left off on. So let's go ahead and control C out of that script, clear that. And so now we have successfully gotten past the first four traces, which represents the first 20% of this assignment, right? It's a 40 point assignment, right? There's 20 traces. We've done four traces already. So there's only 16 more traces to go. Uh, this seems like a good stopping point. I only have like five more minutes to go in this class. I don't think I can accomplish trace five and I don't want to stop mid trace. I made that mistake last class. I do not want to repeat having to reiterate and build everything up and not have a payoff on that. So this just seems like a good uh, portion. Does anyone have any questions? Um, so, uh, so you said that uh, Running with the stuff. So yeah, but we will be evaluated on that. Yes. Um, so right now, one thing you'll notice, I'm, I'm doing bare minimum additions to my code base so that I pass that particular trace with the expectation that my code base is insufficient to pass future traces because I want to motivate what those future traces are for. If I'm really robust and I consider all of the... Uh, header comments between each of the functions and I start implementing ahead, I might pass traces, which is fine if you're a student, but if you're trying to walk through and provide the motivation for each of the traces, that's actually kind of a hindrance because it's like, oh, remember that thing we did four traces ago? That's why we passed this trace. So I'm trying to avoid that, but uh, by all means, go ahead. And if you see these instances where you're supposed to mutate and even if you can pass this particular trace, you know it's going to affect a future trace, implement it now and just make your life easy. But I, I'm, I'm purposely employing a use a minimum amount of code for each trace just to get the bare minimal uh, um, success. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Any other questions? No, I will see you on Thursday. Uh, good luck with the tiny shot. So when will when this um, video lecture be posted? This particular one? Uh, probably sometime tomorrow, actually. I actually have a, a, a little spell, so I have to wait for it to process. So I'll try to get it up by uh, the end of day tomorrow. Yeah, I'll use everything for that. And of course, I encourage everyone to work in groups as well. Okay. Is this a better approach where we're walking through the labs and kind of motivating the concepts but as we explore them as opposed to just doing the lectures off of the book itself? Do you feel like you're learning more this way? Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, we, 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 we,